How did Britain's geography help shape the British Empire? We're talking about a relatively small nation known for its green rolling hills and unpredictable weather, managing through brutal imperialism to put huge parts of the planet under its control. Colonies in every corner of the world, people subjugated, naval fleets arguably unrivaling any other European power, with effects still being felt globally to this day. Buckingham Palace announced the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. This was history's most expansive empire. But today, I want to look at the geographical factors at home that led to its initial expansion around the globe. As it turns out, before there was a British empire, there was just Britain and some very beneficial resources and location-based factors. This week, I was scrolling Reddit and I saw this joke. Britain tried to conquer the world for spices and then decided that they didn't like them anyway. And to that I say, yeah, it's kind of true. But this got me thinking about the British Empire itself, along with its lasting impacts. While well celebrated at different times of the year, one of the most common holidays in the world is independence from the British. 48 different nations have a day set aside specifically to commemorate this. Some of these countries gained independence peacefully, some through revolution, and many after years and years of atrocities from colonizers. Before we get into that, we need to dive into the British Isles themselves. People settled on the island of Great Britain around 10,000 BCE. I'm going back this far because I want to establish the type of place much of what now the United Kingdom was. We need to understand how its resources and location eventually aided it growing into an empire. To start, there was a huge amount of available farmland. Rye and barley were some of the most prolific crops originally grown. That's not to mention legumes and oats, along with enough land for all manner of livestock. And equally important here is the Romans. Are you not entertained? That's where a lot of British and really Western European farming and irrigation practices came from. Now let's flash forward 11 millennia-ish, past the Roman Empire, the origins of the Anglo and Saxons, and even past the Magna Carta. Wait, we went a little far on that last one. Though we're gonna be discussing places around the world today, I think it's important we stayed centered here. England was formed as a unification of Anglo-Saxon kingdoms by King Athelstan in 927 CE. And while it started as a collection of kingdoms, in the long run, being an island put this United Kingdom in a good spot as it protected them from invasions from mainland Europe. The first major expansion off the main island would come in the 1490s. This was the 1497 voyage of John Cabot, who was commissioned by King Henry VII to try and find a quicker boat-based trade route to Asia via a rumored Northwest Passage through the Arctic. Such a passage, by the way, didn't exist back then. That didn't stop Cabot from declaring success, even though where he landed is actually now Newfoundland. Was Cabot particularly a good explorer? Well, seeing as on his following mission to Asia, he mysteriously disappeared, probably not. The Cabot missions were likely commissioned in response to the previous Atlantic missions of Spain and Portugal. No true attempts to establish colonies would come until the tail end of the 1500s. And now that brings us to another major factor in Britain's expansion. Back in the day, the British Isles had a lot of trees. And as it turns out, a lot of them were rather excellent for shipbuilding, particularly oak and Scots pine. Kind of a shame they tore through most of them in a matter of centuries. The amount of Great Britain covered by forest dropped from over 65% over the course of the empire's growth. An estimated over 15% of the island was covered by trees in the time of William the Conqueror in 1086. But by 1905, that number was just 5.2%. The abundance of this one resource alone probably affected the British Empire's early capabilities more than anything else. Overland trade from China, India, and the Middle East via the Silk Road had recently started to have a profound effect on British life, especially in cities like London. This is how, for example, tea first entered the country. Ships meant that British merchants could potentially circumvent traveling middlemen with short supplies. If merchants could reach colonies by boat, they could buy goods straight from the source. However, merchants are just part of the story. Timber resources also meant that the British Navy could be created, continuously expanding and eventually becoming one of the colonial era's most powerful forces. This led to expeditions setting out and colonies being set up all around the globe. 
with the first major ones coming in the early 1600s. Whether started by British companies or religious groups such as the Puritans, any of these colonies set up under a British flag meant more expansion, more reach, more power, and more goods. In the sense of geography, trade can be boiled down to a really simple idea. People in an area crave a resource they don't already have, so they seek it from somewhere that does. Trade is often much more complex and darker than that. Looking back at history, the countries of Europe were not known for getting along. And even in times of peace, trade can have its weird intricacies. Treaties, tariffs, and land claim disputes can add extra steps to simply exchanging goods at the best of times and completely holding them up at the worst of times. So what better way to try and circumvent this than to just try and have a presence, well, everywhere. On one hand, in some cases, suddenly a place with items your people crave is under your control. No need to deal with a lot of potential bureaucracy. This trade is now technically internal. And that was the goal of the British. They wanted to control trade across the globe, often with no regard to the peoples who lived in the lands that they claimed. As the centuries went on, the number of colonized places and available range of goods kept growing. From across North America came huge amounts of cotton, hemp, and tobacco. And from the Caribbean came sugarcane. Much of this ultimately flowed back to Great Britain, with a surge of colonists and traditional manufactured goods flowing back to the colonies. Only issue, oh no, it's the 1600s, the price of labor from colonists is rising, even if they're poorly treated servants being trapped by crippling debt. We've got to find a way to solve this problem and keep global trade flowing that is ethical, safe, and won't cause generational trauma and cultural pain for hundreds of years to come. In a move that would define Atlantic trade for generations, colonial landowners turned to slavery. And slavery fueled by an industry based around literally capturing people, usually men, on the continent of Africa and shipping them abroad against their will, helped become one of the largest, bloodiest fuels for the fires of imperial expansion. Across the Americas, the Caribbean, and even to an extent back to Britain, manual labor was carried out daily for wealthy landowners by slaves. And staying centered on Great Britain itself, manufactured goods would leave Britain by ship for African countries. From there, goods would be sold to villages and deals would be made with local slave catchers. Then the kidnapped slaves would be loaded back onto ships and taken to the so-called New World, the Americas and the Caribbean, where they would be used as slaves in the plantation works and even ore mining. While the British weren't the only European empire to thrive off the enslavement of African peoples, the fact that for centuries slavery proved to be the backbone of the colonial workforce cannot be disputed. While I may not be the best person to discuss these horrors, the fact that people were torn from their homes, packed into ships like cattle, and if they survived the overseas trip, sold off and forced to perform back-breaking labor in lands where they didn't speak the language. This isn't even to mention the physical, emotional, and even sexual abuse slave masters were often responsible for. In 1807, the slave trade itself was outlawed by British Parliament. The practice was outlawed in the empire as a whole in 1834. And that wasn't done peacefully, despite what's taught in schools to so many. Slavery was abolished because slaves started to band together and rebel against the brutal, often torturous treatment from their owners. However, though slavery was outlawed, the native inhabitants were treated abhorrently by the overwhelming white settlers, effectively making them second-class citizens in the lands that they'd lived in for millennia. By the 1830s, the British Empire spanned much of what is now Canada, parts of India and South Asia, Australia, South and Western Africa, and South America. The only major loss up to this point came with the American Revolution of 1776, which saw most of British North America, south of Canada, gain independence in the 1780s. But the empire continued to grow, and even after this, it didn't reach its true peak until 1919. Throughout the 18th and 19th centuries, and through the First World War, the size of the empire grew and grew until it literally encompassed over 20% of the globe. There was a saying, the sun never sets on the British Empire because the empire stretched quite literally across the planet. From Singapore to the whole of India and Pakistan to Egypt to New Zealand, the British truly ruled over the global empire. But a massive empire means many mouths to feed. And as was shown in the United States, major unrest could lead to revolution. 
At this point, many of the natural resources of Great Britain itself were being used up at an alarming rate, rocketed in part by the Industrial Revolution. For most of the duration of the British Empire, colonial governments were able to tightly rule territories and trade. But after World War I, there was a shift. Though Britain was on the winning side of World War I, a surge of independent movements began in the colonies. And then in World War II, where Britain was once again on the winning side, major cities such as London were leveled, and Britain itself was left nearly bankrupt. The balance of power had also shifted globally, and the British government knew this. The two new major world powers following World War II were the US and the USSR, two countries that we've actually talked about in previous videos, so subscribe if you haven't already. As such, the post-war government adopted a policy of peaceful disengagement, where colonies could leave the empire peacefully, on paper. Issues such as the Palestinian-Israel conflict can be traced back to botched British decolonization efforts in the early 20th century, but I'm not getting into that here. From 1945 to 1965, the number of British citizens living outside of the UK fell from over 700 million to just 5 million. And while some small colonies still exist today, such as Bermuda, the UK really doesn't have much of an empire left. There's technically the Commonwealth, which include former colonies such as Canada, South Africa, and Jamaica. These are countries which still have certain formal ties to the UK to a degree, but still very much have asserted their independence. The Commonwealth can stir uncomfortable memories of Britain's colonial history, especially the former Caribbean and South American colonies, which were once at the heart of the slave trade. Such as Barbados, which recently cut ties with the monarchy by becoming a republic. I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Barbados according to law. This is a story about more than just the rise and fall of an empire. It's a quest for trade dominance and power, fueled by geographical benefits at home and the adaptation of brutal practices abroad. As we can see by the disputes raging in the world now, the British Empire has a legacy that still lives on today, even if the sun has set on the empire itself.